Hello, we start a new chapter today. And we're going to skip around this chapter. We're not going to cover every section kind of like like we've been doing in previous chapters. We seem like we're covering every single section. But we're going to skip around because we don't need ev all the details from this section. Um, or sorry, from this chapter. Some of the middle sections you'll cover in a, um, a future class. So, And they're, they're pretty complicated, so we don't want to you know, confuse things at this point. We just want to get what we need in order to be successful in the next class and not not worry about all these complicated things that you don't even need yet. So we're starting chapter five, and this is talking about systems of linear equations, which if you took algebra, you should have seen before. So this first section should be review, but the next section that we cover, section 5.1, should be brand new. Prob I mean, probably, um, unless you had a really, really go-getter teacher for your algebra class, I guess, then that's good. But this, this section is called systems of linear equations in two variables. So as you can kind of see from the first example down here, what you'll have is the system, which they usually use kind of the squiggly bracket to show the system. Um, but it's one linear equation, so here he is. One linear equation, you know, the 2x minus 3y equals negative 4. And then there's another linear equation, a second one. Linear equation. So this is the kind of thing we're going to want to solve. It's like the first equation kind of gives you a relationship between x and y. The second one gives you another relationship between x and y. And just knowing two relationships between x and y should should allow you to be able to figure out what x and y are. That's the idea. So first thing though, let's see if we can even determine, or do we even know how to determine if a certain ordered pair or point like this guy, 7 comma 6, is it a solution of a system? So I don't know, if you haven't seen this before, the idea is I should be able to substitute this, the values of 7 and 6 in for x and y, you know, respectively, and I should get a true statement for both of those equations. So that's the idea, yeah. If, um, you know, that particular ordered pair, or, or in another problem, it could be another ordered pair, but if, if this guy is a solution to the system, substituting you know, x equals 7, y equals 6 should result in true statements. For both equations is the idea. Okay, so we'll just do it one at a time. Maybe I'll start with the, you know, the top equation. It's 2x minus 3y equals negative 4, but we said we should be able to replace x with 7, so I'll replace x with 7, and then y with 6, and I should get a true statement. If I don't get a true statement here, then it's already, that point 7 comma 6 is no good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's not a solution, but it could be. Let's see, what do we got? If I simplify that, 7 times 2 is 14, minus 3 times 6 is 18. 14 minus 18 is negative 4, so this is true. True. Okay, so so far so good, but I have to be able to substitute that point in, or that ordered pair, or point, whatever, into both equations and get a true statement. So I can't just test it in one and say, okay, yeah, we're done. I have to test it in both in order to say it's a, it is a solution or not. So let's see, I substituted in the same kind of way. X is 7, Y is uh, 6, and I simplify. 2 times 7 is 14 plus 6. Well, oops. 14 plus 6 is 20, which is not equal to 4. This is false. That means that 7, 6 is not a solution to the system. So that's my conclusion. Even though, um, even though the point, it worked for one of the equations, it didn't work for both, so that means it's a no-go. Okay, and then, you know, and what we're talking about here is, I mean, in the big picture, when they say there's a solution to the system, that means that I should be able to, or well, that point should be on both lines. So I guess the idea is these, both of those are linear equations, so they both rep, can rep, be represented by lines visually. Let's say there's one line, I'm just making it up. I don't know if it really looks like that. And then let's say, here's another line, it goes wee, or something like that. The solution to the system would actually be that intersection point, that place where they intersect. Solution is this one guy. So the, technically, you know, if you th think about it, 
There should only be one solution to every system of equations. And I guess apparently in this problem, that wasn't the right one. 7 comma 6 was not the right one. Although it did work for the first equation, that meant that that point was on that line. It didn't work for the second equation, which means it wasn't on that line. So it's probably some point out in left field, like here. Hopefully you can see that. You know, that, that is on the red line, but it's not on the green line. So it's technically not a syst uh, solution to the system. But just kind of so we're prepared for future problems, that's one thing that can happen. But also, if you think about some some lines are actually parallel. Some are perpendicular, some are neither. So what, I guess what you could have is, let's say there's the same red line, but what if the green line had a different slope than it did in the first one that we drew? It has the, actually the same slope. Well, if there are parallel lines like this, then there's no solution to the system. To the system, because when you find, like we said, when you find a solution to a system of equations, you're looking for where they intersect. And obviously parallel lines are never going to intersect. So we'll see that coming up in a little while, that sometimes you'll try to solve a system of equations and you'll get no solution. Which must mean that they, are, they were parallel lines in disguise. And the very last thing that can happen is, let's say, here's one line, the red guy. And then you go to graph the other equation, the other line, and it actually ends up being right on top of the, the first one. So they're actually the same line in disguise. Same line, I guess. Well, I could say both equations are the same line, I guess, in disguise. You might not have known it by looking at them, but you end up graphing them and they're the same line. That means that there are infinitely many solutions. Or I could say an infinite number of solutions. Because like we said, the so number of solutions or a solution to a system is, is the number or the places where they intersect. And clearly these two lines intersect everywhere. There are infinitely many places where they intersect. That's why there are infinitely many solutions. We'll see one of those three things happening either, like in this first, the first picture we drew, there's either, either going to be one specific solution, the place where they intersect, no solution because they're parallel lines, so they never intersect, or every single point on the line is a solution because they happen to be the same line after all. But anyway, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, just so we're ready for if that happens. So this next one, they also want us to determine if this other ordered pair, 2 comma 3, is a solution to this system. So you have to te check both equations, but I just I usually just grab the top one, try it, and then the bottom one, but it doesn't matter what order you try it in. So okay, this is my first equation, but I'm trying to substitute the point they gave me in, see if it's true. If 2 goes in for x and 3 goes in for y, let's see what happens. 2 plus 3 times y, but y is also 3. 2 plus 9 is 11. That's true. Okay, so so far so good. This this point does seem like it's a solution, but I do have to check the second equation also. So let's try it in there. x minus 5y equals negative 13, and I'm going to substitute that point that they gave me in, or that ordered pair. 2 goes in for x, 3 goes in for y. Let's see here. So it's x minus 5 times y, which is 3, supposedly equals negative 13. We'll see about that. 2 minus 15 equals 13, or sorry, negative 13. That's true, yeah, negative 13 equals negative 13. Since that's a true statement, both are true, so that means that 2, 3 is a solution to the system. Which means that that is a point of intersection. So if you were to graph both of those lines, they would intersect at 2, comma 3. And just, you know, from past experience, I can tell those are not the same line, these guys, only because I've seen a lot of these problems. They're not the same line, so that means this is the only solution. All right. So now, I mean, by now we know kind of if they give us a potential solution, how do we check whether it is a solution or not? But the next couple of objectives are, what if you have no idea what could possibly be a solution, then how would you figure it out? The first one, you might have seen this before, you use the substitution method to figure out kind of, you know, algebraically how to um, how to solve a system of equations. So it's kind of described here in the bold. The substitution method says, okay, you want to solve one of the equations for either variable. So it sounds like, you know, you can choose x or y, and you can choose either equation. So you have a lot of freedom. And once you do that, though, you're getting that variable by itself on one side. Then you're going to substitute into the other equation for that variable. So kind of look at the system of equations here. The top one, you know, it wouldn't be hard to get x or y by itself. 
But I see that the bottom one actually already has Y by itself. Y is already isolated. So I kind of actually get to skip a step. Y is already... So that's kind of nice. If it wasn't isolated, I would do it. You know, either isolate Y or X in one of the equations. Isolated in, you know, that bottom equation. So all I have to do is I'm going to grab that top equation. Let me see. It's X plus Y equals 4. Just so I kind of have it in front of me. And I'm taking the equation that, you know, either you solved for a variable or it was already solved for you. So Y is already by itself. That means I'm going to take what Y is equal to and substitute it into the other equation for Y. I just kind of use logic to make it make sense in my head. I say, well, Y is equal to 3X because that's what this equation tells me. That means that this y should also be equal to 3x. So I should be able to replace it. So that's, that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to replace the y in that equation, x plus y equals 4, with 3x. Because that's, I guess, what the, the red equation told me I could do. y is equal to that thing, so I should be able to replace it. Alright, so the first, or this uh, x plus y equals 4 equation is going to become x plus... Instead of y equals 4, it's going to be 3x equals 4. Because that's what y was equal to. And at this point, you know you're doing a good job, or you kind of, you know, you substituted correctly, because I only have one variable left. That's a good sign. Only one variable left. I guess that's the idea, because you can't solve an equation that has two variables. You won't know what either of them are, but once you get down to an equation that only has one variable, like what we have x plus 3x equals 4, then you actually have a chance of solving it. So of course to solve this I'm going to combine like terms. So let me write it one more time just to be safe. x plus 3x equals 4. Well these are like terms. I can write it as 4x. 4x equals 4. And then to finish it off we'll divide both sides by 4. So it looks like x equals 1 is... Um, well, that's the x value anyway. I think this is something that a lot of people forget in these problems is that what you're trying to do, like we said, big picture here, is find the point of intersection. Because these guys, x plus y equals 4, and y equals 3x, those are two lines. We want to know where they intersect, what point. Well, we've just found the x value at which they intersect, but we haven't found the y value. So we have to actually substitute this into one of the equations to find y. And you're free to substitute it into either one. It's going to give you the same solution regardless. Substitute into one of the equations containing y to find y. So you could substitute it into either of the original, but usually the one that's the easiest is the one that already has a variable isolated. 3 times blah, okay. There you go. So if x is 1, I should be able to replace that in there for x. So instead of y being equal to 3x, now y is equal to 3 times 1, which is 3. Alright, so now we know both both uh, coordinates here. x is 1 and y is 3. So that would be my solution. The point 1, 3. x equals 1, y equals 3 is the solution. That's the idea behind substitution. So let's try it one more time in this next example. Um, but this one I think we actually have to put a little more effort in. Because in the previous one, they already had one of the equations had a variable by itself. But in this one, notice the first equation, x and y are on the same side. Same thing in the second equation. But kind of looking at each one, you know, like, okay, there's 3x, there's 2y, there's 2x, there's y. I think the one that would be easiest to isolate would be this y, because he doesn't have a coefficient. That's kind of my idea here. This, yeah, this y would be easiest to isolate. Isolate. because it has no coefficient. So that's my idea. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Although you could isolate any of the other variables as well. I think it's just, you can kind of picture, what if I were to try to isolate, you know, I could even think about the same equation, this second guy. What if I try to isolate x, though? I would have to subtract y to the other side, which is not that bad. But then I'd have to divide all the terms by 2, which would produce fractions. I don't like fractions that much, and then especially if I have an expression containing fractions and I have to substitute that into another equation, that's going to be bad. So you really, you would, it's really exciting actually when you see um, 
a variable all by itself with no coefficients. That's the one you want to jump on. So I'm going to take this and solve for y, which all that would involve is subtracting the 2x over to the other side. Now it's all by itself. So y must be equal to either 1 minus 2x, or you could write negative 2x plus 1. You know, either way, it doesn't really matter. You're going to substitute that into the, the equation we haven't touched yet. So now, if, yeah, now I finally grabbed the equation that we haven't looked at yet. 3x plus 2y equals 4, and where the y was, I'm going to substitute this 1 minus 2x, um, yeah, I was, I was going to say replace, either way, substitute, or like we said, you could substitute negative 2x plus 1, it doesn't really matter, so it'll be 3x plus 2 times y, but according to the other equation, I know y is equal to 1 minus 2x, so I should be able to replace it, so instead of 3x plus 2y equals 4. It's 3x plus 2 times, parentheses, 1 minus 2x equals 4. All right. And now I kind of, if you want, you can check to make sure, does this equation only have one variable now? Yes, there's only an x. Or only a y. It doesn't really matter which one, as long as it's only one or the other. Let me simplify here. 3x plus, and if I distribute the 2, I get 2 minus 4x equals 4. Now i got a couple like terms here. 3x minus 4x makes a negative x plus that 2 that was already there, equals 4, okay. Now I can solve this if I, let's see, subtract 2 over to the other side, that would be the f first step. Negative x equals 2, but I need, I need to get rid of that negative, so I can either multiply both sides by negative 1 or divide by both sides by negative 1. Either way you get x all by itself and it ends up being negative 2. But remember, just because you find one variable's value doesn't mean you're done, because what I want, my answer should be an ordered pair. So I'm kind of like halfway done, although you've pretty much done more work than half the work. You've, yeah, you've done more than half the work at this point. But now I need to substitute this guy, substitute the value I just found. Substitute x equals negative 2 into any of the equations that had a y and a x. So um, I could use one of the originals, but usually the one that's easiest is the one that you, you know, you've got a variable by itself. So at this point, I got y all by himself. That's usually the one you want to substitute into to find the second variable. I mean, it would work either way. You can go back to one of the originals, of course, and you get the right answer, but just to make your life easier, I think the easiest one's going to be the one that has a variable by itself. So let me see. I'm substituting a negative 2 in for x. So let's see. Here he is. Because um, we said x equals negative 2, so that's going to go right here where the x was. Let's see. Negative 2... And all I have to do now is simplify. y equals 1, and that actually become a plus 4, so 5. There we go. And of course, you know, there's the solution, or what we think is the solution, but you could always check your work by substituting that. Substitute, you know, x equals negative 2, y equals 5, into both of the original equations, kind of like, you know, what we did in objective 1. So we think this is a solution, but if we want to make sure, I want to substitute that into, was it 3x plus 2y equals, was it 5? I already forgot. Or 4, sorry, 4. And then 2x plus y equals 1. 4. Oh, wait, 2x plus y equals 1, yeah. So at this point, yeah, that, that's kind of like the first objective was showing us how to check our solutions here. Um, but the second objective is actually solving so if you want, you could do that. I would definitely do that on an exam, you know, just to make sure you did everything right. Sometimes just you miss a negative sign one place, and then all of a sudden everything's screwed up. So, I mean, I would be mad at myself if I did that on an exam. Like, I got points marked off. Even though I did, yeah, I, knew, I knew the process and I did everything right, I just forgot a negative here or there, and that screwed up the whole thing. All right, so that was good. Um, I think, you know, substitution method's good for if you have a sy system of equations like we had in the last objective where... Where was it? Um, remember we said that that y variable in the second equation, it wasn't so bad to solve for, you know? It was like, oh, I can isolate him pretty easily. I just have to subtract that 2x, and then he'll be all by himself. But, I mean, if you look at the system that's coming up in this next objective here, what was it? It's 4x plus 5y. Just first, in that equation, imagine trying to get x by itself. You'd have to subtract 5y over, which is not so bad. But then you'd have to divide all the terms by 4, which would result in an equation that looks terrible. It'd be 
um, 3 minus 5y, but you had to divide all the terms by 4, so you'd end up with this, ugh, which is terrible. Now try to imagine substituting that in for y here. Oh my gosh, you have a bunch of fractions. It would be, te be terrible. You definitely don't want to mess with that if you don't have to. So we come up with this other um, method for solving systems of equations. This is kind of for when substitution doesn't really work very well. So it's called the elimination method. It's kind of, it's got a, if you've never seen it before, it's kind of got a steeper learning curve, I think. You know, it's a little harder to master, but um, once you master it, then I think people actually like this method better. I, I know I do. So it's kind of weird, yeah, at first, but it's, it's good. Um, let's see, it says elimination method. We need to be able to add the equations and have one of the variables cancel out. That's the idea. So imagine right now, while we're at it, imagine adding these equations together. Well, then you would add the like terms. The 4x and the 2x make 6x. The 5y and the negative 3y would make 2y. So you'd still have x's and y's. You wouldn't be missing any variables. So what, what we'd like to have happen is I'd like to be able to add those two equations and have either x's cancel or the y's cancel. But that would mean that the coefficients of x or y must be the same number but with opposite signs. So for example, in parentheses they say, such as 2x and negative 2x. Because imagine if those were your x, um, x terms, I guess, if you add those together, 2x and negative 2x, that's zero. So that, that's kind of the idea here. You want to cancel them out by making them the same number but with opposite signs. So in order to do that, we have to multiply one or both of the equations by whatever's necessary to make this happen. Then you want to add the equations together and solve the resulting one. So I think the first thing I would do, it's, yeah, that sounds like a lot, but I would look at the x terms and the y terms and say, you know, are these x coefficients closer to being the same number or are the y coefficients? Well, I guess it's like, um, almost like you're looking for the least, least common multiple? Yeah. Least common multiple, I guess. Multiple of the coefficients. So for x, I guess, for example, if I'm looking at x in particular, the least common multiple of their coefficients, 4 and 2, is actually 4. And if you know, it's been a while since you saw least common multiple or you don't remember seeing it ever, least common multiple is pretty much, it's like the least common denominator, you know? Imagine you had two fractions, one of which had a denominator of four and one of which had a denominator of two. Like if, you know, for example, you had one fourth plus one half, what would be the common denominator? It'd be four. That's kind of the idea. I'm gonna keep that in mind, but what about for the y terms? The least common multiple of the y terms coefficient, five, negative three is okay imagine those are denominators that i want to need i need a common denominator for the least common multiple would be 15 actually you know so if you had a fraction that looked like one fifth and another one that looked like negative one third or something and you want to combine them you'd have to get a common denominator of 15. so i think to me the clear winner is the first or x i'd like to get rid of the x's because four is a smaller number than 15. you know 15 might be a lot of work so I, I think I will, this is a smaller number than 15 here, down there. So I decide to eliminate x. Okay. That means that I need to make both coefficients of x be that LCM, which we said was 4. But as it described in the, um, in the beginning, in the green highlighted area, we need one of them to be negative, but 1 negative. So that's kind of my goal now, now that I've thought about it for a second. Let me see. I'm going to rewrite the system of equations down here because I'm kind of running out of room. 4x plus 5y equals 3. That's the top one. And then 2x minus 3y equals 7. So I'm looking at this system, and we know that we need to get both coefficients of x to be a 4, although one needs to be negative. Well, the top one's already there. It's already got a 4. So maybe all I would need to do is work on the bottom one. So I need to multiply the bottom one by 2 to make it a 4. But we said one needs to be negative, one needs to be positive, so maybe while I'm at it, I'll multiply by a negative 4. Or sorry, a negative 2. That'll give me a new, you know, new second equation, but it'll be so nice because it'll combine with the top equation to give me um, x is canceling. So I'm leaving the top equation the same. He's good, but let me distribute the bottom, the negative 2 into the bottom equation. Multiply 
the second equation by negative two. That's my idea here to make to make my goal happen that I was describing earlier. Well, that would make the second equation transform into negative 4x. It actually become a plus 6y and then negative 14 on the other side. And now, like it described, I want to add these equations together. And since, you know, the like terms are already lined up, I can just add vertically. The x's are going to cancel because it's a 4x and a neg negative 4x, which, like we said, was the goal. You got 5y and 6y. That makes 11y. Then on the other side, 3 and negative 14 makes negative 11. All right, now that one variable is missing, I should be able to solve the re for the remaining variable. For the remaining variable. All right, and that's not so bad. Here I just have to divide both sides by 11. So it looks like y is going to be negative 1. That's my solution. But like in the previous objective, what we found was we're, so we're solving systems of equations, so my solution should look like an ordered pair. So we found the y value, negative 1. <clears throat> Excuse me, we just have to find the x value now. But that's kind of a similar way. That what we've done so far is the new method. But to find the second variable, all you have to do is substitute that back into one of the originals. So I'm going to substitute negative 1 into either of the original equations. It doesn't matter. And no. Equations. I usually look back and say, all right, which one had the smallest numbers? I'm going to substitute into that. So let me see. Where were they? Oh, it's kind of a toss-up. I guess the bottom one has smaller numbers, the 2 and the 3. Either way, it's going to give you the right answer, so it's up to you. But I think I'll just grab that second one, the 2x minus 3y equals 7. 2x minus 3y equals 7. And we're saying that y equals negative 1. So I should be able to substitute that right there where that y is and figure out what x is. So it's 2x, let's see, minus 3 times y, but y is negative 1 equals 7. And I'm almost done with this problem now. I just have to simplify here. That's 2x plus 3 equals 7. If I move that 3 over by subtracting it, I get 2x equals 4. And then the last step would be divide by 2. There's x. x must be 2. All right, so my answer is 2 comma negative 1. There we go. So just make sure you keep x and y, you know, in, in the correct places. Even though I found negative 1 first, that's still the y value, so it should go on the right. And the x value goes on the left. All right, let's try that process one more time with this other example, and then I think maybe we'll get the hang of it. And if you don't really feel that comfortable with it, I think the more problems you try, like in the homework or whatever, you'll, you'll feel a lot better. So, okay, let's try to do the same thing now. So what we need to do is either eliminate the x terms or the y terms. So let me see. I'm going to look at the x coefficients first. And, you know, I'm writing this all out, like here, at x coefficients. But this should be, you know, eventually it's all just going on in your head. You don't have to write this out. The x coefficients are 3 and 2. So I want to find the least common multiple of 3 and 2. Okay. Well, thinking of fractions, if I had, if I had to find a common denominator between 3 and 2, it would be 6. So that's, that's that guy's least common multiple. I'm trying to determine now if I want to eliminate x or y. Whichever one has the least common multiple is the one I'm probably going to work on. The y coefficients, let's see, are, let's see, they're 4, well, negative 4. Negative 4 and 3. The least common multiple of negative 4 and 3 is 12, which is bigger than the other one, you know? So I'd probably rather work on the x coefficients. So that's my idea. I will eliminate x because this LCM LCM is smaller. That means it's a little less work and I have to deal with fewer big numbers, I guess. All right, so at least I have the right idea. Let me bring that system of equations down here. It's 3x minus 4y equals 11 and then 2x plus 3y equals negative 4. Okay, that looks good. So I want to transform both equations so that they have a 6 here. So that's kind of my idea now. I need these to be sixes. To both be six, but one of them has to be negative. Negative. But it actually doesn't matter which one's negative. Like, if I make the first one negative, you make the second one negative, we should end up with the same solution either way. It's just, as long as one of them is negative, one's positive. 
But okay, if I focus on the top one, for example, this is, is currently a 3. If I needed to be a 6, I would have to multiply it by a 2 to get there, right? 2 times 3x would be 6x. So it kind of tells me what I want to happen on that one. And maybe just while I'm at it, I might as well figure out what, the, what that's going to become. If I distribute that 2 in, it'll become 6x minus 8y equals 22. So it's kind of the new transform versions of that top equation. The bottom one, though, let's see. Currently, the x coefficient is a 2. If I want it to be a 6, I need to multiply by 3. But we said one of them needs to be a negative, so I just have to multiply one of these by a negative number. I just make the bottom one negative, whatever. So instead of multiplying it by 3, I'll multiply it by negative 3, just to make sure that the 6s are opposite signs. So if I multiply that entire equation, every single term, by negative 3, I get, let's see, negative 6x minus 9y equals positive 12, because it's a negative times a negative. Alright, and then once you do that, you should be able to add these equations together, and one of the variables um, disappears, if you did it right. So if I add these, the x's do disappear. 6x and negative 6x is nothing, so they cancel. And then I have negative 8y and negative 9y is negative 17y. On the other side, 22 and 12 is 34. Okay. And then I should be able to solve this equation for the remaining variable y. Alright, but that's not so bad. I'll just divide by negative 17. So we'll go, okay, negative 17. And sometimes, you know, this number goes in evenly. Like here, it actually that goes in twice, or sorry, negative two times. But if it doesn't go in evenly, you'll end up with a fraction as your answer, which is fine. Sometimes the answers are fractions. So we got y, that means the solution is going to be something comma negative two. I just got to figure out the x value. So I go up and figure out which one I want to substitute into. Which one of the originals was nicer? I guess the bottom one it seems like it has slightly smaller numbers, you know, 2x. Um, plus 3y equals negative 4. So I'm going to grab that guy, bring him down here so I can substitute the y value I found. But like I said, if you choose the first equation, the top one, 3x minus 4y equals 11, you're going to get the same solution as I am either way. As long as you're careful, you know, and you don't make mistakes. 2x plus 3y equals negative 4. Okay. Substitute that y value we found, negative 2 into that guy. So it'll become 2x plus 3 times y, but I'm going to put a negative 2 where y was. There we go. And simplify it, and then try to solve. 2x, that would be, become a minus 6 equals negative 4. And now to solve it, I'll add 6 to the other side. It'll become 2x equals 2, and the last step would be divide by 2. Okay, the x value of this solution must be 1. There's our solution. 1 comma negative 2. There he is. Beautiful. And like I said, I think if this is this is on the homework, it's up to you if you want to check or not, because the homework will tell you whether you're right or wrong. But if this is on an exam, I would definitely check that by substituting, you know, the 1 for x and the negative 2 for y into both of the original equations, making sure they're both true. All right, let's see. Then the next objective is now we want to... This is where we're going to talk about those weird situations, like... You know, we said that sometimes lines will have one solution because they intersect once. Sometimes if they're parallel, though, they'll have no solution. And then sometimes if they are, let's see, they're actually the same line in disguise, they'll have infinitely many solutions. So I think these, you'll see that one of those weird things is going to happen. This will kind of show us how to deal with those weird things. Okay, so I'm looking at this system here. It just says solve the system. It doesn't say how, you know, so I could choose substitution or elimination. So I, I usually look at this and I say, okay, would any of these four variables, this 5x, the 2y, the 10x, the 4y, would any of those variables be kind of easy to isolate? And I'd say not really. I think no matter which one you try to isolate, you're going to produce fractions. So I'm, I, don't, I probably wouldn't go for this, the substitution method. So that's kind of in my head I'm thinking that. None of the variables are easy to isolate. So I'll use the elimination method, because if there was one variable that was easy to isolate, I'd use substitution, but there aren't, so I'm, I'm going to skip that uh, method. So okay, I'm looking at, look at, now that we've kind of got an idea for the elimination method, I think, I'm going to rewrite these equations down here. Da -da 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 -da. I'm looking at the coefficients of x are 5 and negative 10. 
Let's see, their least common multiple would be 10, which is kind of big, versus the least common multiple of the y's is 4. That's smaller. So I think I'll work on the y's. And the second equation, the bottom one, already has a 4 in front of it. But I could easily make the top equation have a 4 if I multiply by 2. And actually, that would make, make it so one of them's positive and one of them's negative. So I think that'll be perfect. I'll, you know, I already thought about it. I'll eliminate y only because the least common multiple of the y's is smaller than the least common multiple of the x's. So that will transform the top equation into 10x minus 4y equals 8. The second equation, though, we already said we don't really need to touch because it already has the perfect coefficient on y. And now we should be able to add these guys together. Let's see, and x's do cancel. That's good. Oh, wait, if y's cancel too. So it's 0 on the left side equals, and then 8 plus 7 is 15. So that's kind of weird. So let me see. I'm going to kind of make a note of this. Both variables canceled. And we were left with, if you think about it, what kind of statement is this? 0 equals 15. That's not true, right? That's false. That's a false statement. 0 is not equal to 15. False statement. If you ever see that happen where, you know, you use the elimination method or the substitution method, and you think, oh, one variable is going to disappear when actually both variables disappear on accident, that means that something funny is going on. And if you're left with a false statement like we see, that means there's no solution. So it must have been that those two equations are actually parallel lines in disguise. So if you were to try to graph these guys, you know, graph that on the xy coordinate system and then graph the other guy, you notice that they're actually parallel lines in disguise. And we were going to look for something that doesn't even exist. They don't intersect, so we were looking for something that doesn't even exist. Yeah, that's nice, huh? All right, let's try this other one here. And, you know, I think this one, though, it lends itself to the substitution method because this top equation already has a variable isolated. X is isolated. You could use elimination if you want, but you'd have to get the x and the y terms on the same side and then go about your business. But I think when, when there's already a variable isolated or when a variable is easy to isolate, that's probably the method you want to use, the substitu substitution method. Substitution. Okay, that means since x is isolated, I should be able to take the stuff that's on the other side of it, the 4y minus 8, and substitute that into x in the other equation. So the second equation, the one that doesn't have a variable isolated, 5 times x minus 20y equals negative 40. I'm going to substitute the 4y minus 8. Because that's what x is equal to, according to the top equation. There we go. And at this point, like we said, you can kind of check if you're doing something right. I only see one variable in my equation now, so something must be going right. So let me simplify this. I'm going to distribute. 5 times 4y is 20y. 5 times negative 8 is negative 40. And then you got this minus 20y that was already there equals negative 40. But now if I combine these like terms, 20y and negative 20y is nothing. Zero. And then minus 40. So you end up with this negative 40 equals negative 40. Which, you know, it seems like, oh, a similar thing happened to the previous one. The previous example, we had the variables disappear. So that's, that's, that one, that part is the same. Both variables canceled out or disappeared. I don't know, whatever you want to say. But this time we were left with a true statement. That's because, obviously, this guy's negative 40 is equal to negative 40. So all points on the line are solutions. This is that, um, that situation where these are actually the same line in disguise. This guy, if you were to graph it, would be the exact same line as this guy. So those are actually the same equation in disguise. You know what someone did? Is, let's see, they, they took, for example, that bottom equation. What is it? 5, 5x minus 20y equals negative 40. So imagine, notice that all three of those terms are divisible by 5. What if you divide those guys by 5? You know, the first term, 5x divided by 5 is x. Okay, there he is. 20y divided by 5 is negative 4 which, yeah, there he is, and he's on the other side, so he would become positive. And then 40 divided by 4, or sorry, divided by 5 is 8. 
So these really are the same line in disguise. Someone just disguised them. So like we said, the solution is all points on the line. And the way you write that is the set of all points, x comma y, such that, and then you throw in one of the equations, like maybe the top one. What was it? x equals 4y minus 8. So this, what we just wrote in red, is just the math way to say all points on the line are solutions. Because it's saying, I want all the points, x comma y, such that, blah, 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 blah. This is the relationship, so it's on that line. So this is just, and you can grab either equation. Either of the original equations. One of the original equations. If you grab the second one, that's fine too. It doesn't really matter. This is probably the hardest one to remember how to write the solution. That guy. Alright, so I think we've seen all the kind of weird things that can happen with the system of equations. So the, la the last objective here is just going to be, let's see how this could be maybe useful in real life, sort of, or maybe it's not. We'll see. Um, let's see, so just talking about kind of a business here. A company that manufactures running shoes has a fixed cost of 300000 Okay, that means if they, even if they don't even produce any shoes, they're, have, they're having to pay 300000 no matter what. Maybe it's like their factory, you know, they have to pay that much in rent a year or... I don't know, for materials, or who knows what that is. Um, and then additionally, it costs... Now, I guess the fixed cost can't... I don't think that has anything to do with materials, because I think this will have to do with materials. It costs $30 to produce each pair of shoes. So that's, yeah, that's probably materials, and then labor, people that are working on the shoes, or whatever. Um, the shoes are sold for $80 a pair. Okay. So they're kind of like they're making a profit of $50 per pair, although they're having to pay off this fixed cost of theirs. So it's kind of a complicated situation. Let's see, the cost function of producing X pairs of running shoes. So the cost, that's not the cost to the consumer, that's the cost to the manufacturer. So the cost, I guess if I write it as a function, C of X, it's going to be, okay, well for sure they're paying 300000 that's their fixed cost, no matter what. But if they produce a certain number of running shoes, let's say X is the number, well for every running shoe they're having to pay $30, they said. So it's like, for every running shoe, they pay $30, that's what this tells me, plus 300000 regardless of how many shoes they sell. So that'd be your cost function. Or you could, of course, switch those terms around if you wanted to. If you're more comfortable with 30x plus 300000 that kind of looks nicer, huh? Looks more like mx plus b. So I guess that's the idea of the cost. It's um, the, uh, the price the manufacturer has to pay per shoe, 30, times x, plus the fixed cost, which is 30000 in this case. So next thing, they want us to write the revenue function R from the sale of X running shoes. So pretty much that means, how much are they making on each shoe? Well, they did say that um, they're sold for $80 per pair. So if they make 80 pairs, then they're selling, or they're making $80 times the number of pairs. That's the idea. $80 multiplied by the number of pairs sold. You know, that's that's that guy. And the last part here, they want to determine the break-even point. And I think at this point, we don't really know what that means, you know, unless you're a business major or you know someone that's a business major. Describe what this means. So basically, the break-even point is when the revenue equals the cost. Yeah, when they're equal to each other. Revenue equals cost. Yeah, okay. So if you want, you can just kind of substitute. Let's see. The revenue R of X we said was 80X. So I'm going to replace it with 80X. Let's see. Revenue is 80X from part 2. And then the cost we found in part 1, that was 30X plus 300,000 plus all right and then I'm left to solve this equation and that'll tell me um, how many items are sold to break even so let's see if I solve this guy I guess I would just move the 30x over so the x terms are together that would leave me with 50x equals and then 300,000 let's see and then to solve it all the way I would divide both sides by 50 and that should do it. Okay, x would be 6,000. Oops, there we go. Alright, so we've, you know, we've kind of figured out, I guess, 
the x value for the break-even point, but they want to know what this means. So this means um, x. Remember, x is the number of number produced. Is that what they say? X pairs of running shoes produced. Okay, yeah. Um, that means six. I guess if six thousand running shoes. Oops. Are produced. The revenue equals the cost. So just think about that. That means that this manufacturer is making exactly as much money as it costs them to make the shoe. So that kind of makes sense. They're breaking even, but that means they made no money. Their profit is nothing. So their profit is zero dollars, which kind of is not great, but I guess that at least they're not losing money. Is that the happy thing? That's kind of a bummer, huh? So I think that's, you know, that's why this kind of math is important, especially in business, because you kind of want to avoid making no money or making a negative amount of money, which means you lost money, right? That's why I guess that's one of the reasons math is important, so you don't lose money. You wouldn't be a very good business if you did that, right? Um, all right, and we'll see more examples in the next section. The ne next section we cover is actually, we're going to be doing similar things. We're going to use the substitution and elim elimination method but we're going to be solving a nonlinear system of equations, which means that one of the equations we're given, like, um, you know, say in this system right here, one of those is, is not a line, you know. In this section, we've only been talking about where both are lines. But, you know, in the future, in the next section, we're going to say, what if one of the equations actually represents like a circle or something? Say there's a circle, you know, and the second equation could be another circle or a parabola, or it could be a line, whatever. So something like that, if you have a parabola and a circle, you want to know where they intersect? There's actually two points of intersection there and there. So that's what the next section's about. It's And it sounds complicated, but the good news is we already know the substitution and, and elimination method, and that's all we really need. So it should be fun. It's, it's interesting.